In today's car world, we're used to Mustangs and Camaros producing upwards of 500 horsepower naturally aspirated, but it wasn't always this way. Cars weren't always so powerful. So today we're gonna to take a look at some of the most pathetic cars, some of the weakest cars that you would rather Flintstone than actually drive with the engine that's inside of it. All right, getting right into this, let's rewind the clock back to 1979 when Ford released the all new third generation of their famous Mustang. Now this was following the existence of the Blurst Mustang II, which wasn't really a pony car and was realistically Ford's response to cars like the 240Z becoming incredibly popular. Also as a side note, 1979 is the same year that they invented the snowboard. As to how it took them that long to literally just stick boots onto a board, I have no idea. Anyways, the third generation Fox body Mustang was quite a bit larger than the Mustang II before, but it didn't bring the power to match, coming in at a whopping 139 horsepower from its five liter V8 engine. What makes this even funnier is that the same car from the same year equipped with the 2.3 liter turbo engine, an engine with literally half the displacement of the five liter, makes almost as much power at 131 horsepower. And if you thought that was bad, it gets even worse with the 1979 Ford LTD coming in at 129 horsepower from its five liter Windsor V8. Combine that with the fact that four years earlier in 1975 with the Mustang II, you could option that car with the five liter Windsor V8, although it was technically more of a 4.9 liter, and that car output 140 horsepower, which means not only was the Fox Body Mustang low on power, it literally went backwards from just four years prior. Now this next car I didn't really want to put on the list because the total power output of it is actually pretty impressive at 400 horsepower and 465 pound-feet of torque. But the reason it's here is because it used a whopping eight liters of displacement to get there, and that's the first generation Dodge Viper. And I'm not gonna sit here and say that the Viper would somehow be cooler with a smaller engine that still output 400 horsepower, because the excessively large engine is part of what makes the Viper the Viper. That being said, squeezing just 400 horsepower out of an eight liter engine is rather disappointing. You might not think so, because something like the 1991 Corvette output 245 horsepower and 350 pound-feet of torque from its 5.7 liter engine. But if you do the math on that, you'll see the Viper outputs 50 horsepower and 57 pound-feet of torque per liter, while a Corvette is at 43 horsepower and 61 pound-feet of torque per liter, putting these two surprisingly close together in this context. Okay, so what's the big deal? In this context, both the 1991 Corvette and the 1991 Viper are fairly similar. Sure, the total power output is way different, but they're pretty close in terms of power per liter. Well, the big and expensive elephant in the room is that the Viper started at $52,000 while the Corvette started around $32,000. That's a huge price difference and it just puts into perspective the fact that the Viper should have had more than 400 horsepower out of that massive engine. So far we've flamed Ford and Dodge, but now let's aim our sights at Chrysler because they cannot get away for their crimes with the 4.7 liter Powertech engine producing just 235 horsepower and 265 pound-feet of torque. And you might be thinking to yourself, hold on, that's actually not that bad of a power output out of a 4.7 liter. What's the big deal here? And you'd be completely right if we were talking about a 70s, an 80s, or a 90s engine, but we're talking about an engine that could be had in the Dodge Durango as late as 2009. It was also used in the Jeep Grand Cherokee and a bunch of other Dodge, Mopar, Chrysler type of applications. It even made Ward's top 10 best engines for 1999, but if you've seen our other videos, you know that a Ward is more of a curse than a blessing. And to put this engine's poor performance in context, we can look at the 2007 Dodge Ram 1500, which could be had with three different engines, two of which were the 4.7 liter V8 and the 5.7 liter V8, all putting 235 horsepower and 345 horsepower respectively, which comes out to 50 horsepower per liter and 60 horsepower per liter. So yes, this engine could definitely fly as an 80s and 90s engine, but it's not one of those. It's a late 1990s engine and it was produced all the way up until 2009 and made just 50 horsepower per liter, never made more than that even while at the exact same time you could get a 5.7 liter Hemi from Dodge that outputs 60 horsepower per liter. All right, we've picked on the American cars enough. We all know that their power output figures can be pretty embarrassing depending on the context. So let's set our sights on something a little bit more British, starting with the Rolls-Royce 6.75 liter V8 with its earth shattering groundbreaking 215 horsepower. And right off the bat, I know there's going to be some of you who are thinking, yeah, who cares? This is just some old engine from the 1950s. Of course it sucks. And while you'd be partially right, this engine was around in some form or another since the 50s. Realistically, you could draw the line at 1968, but it was also used all the way up until the early 1990s. This engine has actually since gone on to live under the Volkswagen Group and their Bentley vehicles, which now use a twin turbocharged version of this old Rolls-Royce 6.75 liter, producing upwards of 500 
and 30 horsepower. But in something like the 1990s Rolls-Royce Cornici, I don't know how to pronounce that, so if I pronounce it wrong, drop it down in the comments below, this engine produced just 215 horsepower. On the bright side, the torque output is a little bit better at 325 pound-feet of torque, but that's still pretty embarrassing, although better than 215 horsepower. Okay, enough with the massive engines, let's take a look at something a lot smaller, although probably not much lighter, and that's the Chevy Iron Duke with its whopping 85 horsepower from 2.5 liters of displacement. To be fair though, there were versions as high as 110 horsepower, but that's still pretty bad. And if you do the math on this, the 2.5 liter Iron Duke is sitting at 34 horsepower per liter, which makes it one of the weakest engines on the list thus far. I understand that Pontiac and GM needed more fuel efficient vehicles in the 1970s, and that's where this engine came from, the need for fuel efficiency. But seriously, can you imagine buying a 1982 Camaro with this engine? You know, it's the 1980s, muscle cars are everywhere, and everyone is having fun racing stoplight to stoplight, and you pull up with a two and a half liter Camaro that quite literally has a 20 second zero to 60 time. Sure, it's a tough engine, but any engine can be tough when it makes this little power. And by my money, this should qualify as one of the worst engines of all time, period. But that's a topic for a different video. All right, I want you to imagine living in California in the 1970s. The weather is beautiful, the people are nice, the state hasn't been ruined yet, and you'd go out and you'd decide to buy a Corvette. You've always wanted one, but they've always been a little bit too expensive, a little bit out of your reach, a little bit out of your price range. And the day comes that you can finally get one, and you go to buy it, just to find out it makes a whopping 180 horsepower. That's right, the Chevy LG4 is probably the worst mark on the Corvette's otherwise impressive history of performance cars. This came after California set its own emission standards in 1980, and unfortunately, these California-specific standards were so ridiculously hard to reach that for the 1980 model year, Corvettes in California were only available with the anemic 305 cubic inch engine. This puts power at an impressively low 36 horsepower per liter, which is about just as bad as the Chevy Iron Duke we've mentioned earlier. Although I gotta say, 180 horsepower in a Corvette, regardless of context, is unforgivable bad and it's a nasty mark on the Corvette's record. In my opinion, Chevy would have just been better to not sell the Corvette in 1980, that specific model year, because in the following year they were able to get the 350 up to California's emissions standards. You know the old saying that there's no replacement for displacement. Now that saying has a lot of truth to it, but in the case of the Cadillac 500 V8, it couldn't be further from the truth with this behemoth of an 8.2 liter engine producing just 190 horsepower and 360 pound-feet of torque. Now for reference that it's quite literally the worst engine on the list thus far. That is absolutely pathetic, but it wasn't actually always this way with this engine. In fact, in 1970, the Eldorado Coupe was advertised with 400 horsepower and 550 pound-feet of torque. But the fun was short-lived, as GM almost immediately had to start dropping the power for one reason or another. For one, the compression ratio had to be dropped from 10.25 to 1 down to 8.5 to 1 as GM prepared for the introduction of unleaded fuel becoming the standard, which was made significantly worse just a few years later when emissions components choked it all the way down to 235 horsepower, and by 1975, the power output was choked down to that aforementioned 190 horsepower figure. At this power per liter, there are few engines that compare, and that's a pretty bad statement to make. Like, there are very few modern automotive engines that make this little power. And just for context, if this engine was a two liter, it would literally make 48 horsepower. Congrats to GM, this might be one of the weakest engines of all time. Now modern diesels are super powerful and super clean, but it wasn't always this way, so it's time we rewind the clock and look at one of the worst offenders in all of diesel's history, and that's the 6.2 liter Detroit diesel. Now I know some of the diesel guys out there will defend this thing for as long as they're alive, but that's not gonna stop me from telling you how pathetically weak it is at just 128 horsepower and 240 pound-feet of torque. That's even worse than the 500 cubic inch Cadillac engine we had just mentioned at 20.6 horsepower per liter. It's absolutely pathetic. Now, to be fair, this engine sucked in the sense that it was naturally aspirated. And as we all know, diesel engines and turbochargers are meant to be together. Without a turbo, well, you end up with engines like this one. Ironically, when this new diesel engine came out, the 6.2, it was actually supposed to be the fuel efficient alternative to the 454 cubic inch big block engine that most people were buying for towing and hauling. If you wanted a big truck, if you wanted to tow and haul a lot, you bought the 454. But if you wanted something a little bit more fuel friendly that could still tow and haul a lot, you'd go with the diesel. Funny how things change. GM and Detroit half redeemed themselves with the later turbocharged 6.5 liter engines that output more power, 
but it wasn't much and it definitely isn't impressive. Sorry, but it's the truth. The 6.2 and the 6.5 Detroit diesels are absolutely gutless engines. I gotta say, it is kind of disappointing to see so many American engines on this list, but that's kind of just how it is. American engines stuck with a Cayman block design for a very long time. And while that design is great in a lot of different contexts, it's not fantastic at making power per liter. That's just the simple truth of it. Then there's also the issue with government enforced emissions restrictions, forcing the power down, but that's more or less just a side effect of poor engineering in the first place. What other engines would you put on the list? Be sure to drop it down in the comments below. While you're down there, smash the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video, because it really helps me out a lot. Get subscribed so you don't miss out on future videos. Check out some of the other stuff on the channel. Also, be sure to check us out on Instagram and TikTok. We post a lot on there too, and I'll see you guys in the next one.